Hey everybody, welcome to the special Zenny 62 on YouTube. Welcome and without much further ado, I'm going to start off by um, having you watch this so clip I'm from Sheltered Mercy. Okay. For a free democratic society with the kind of wealth we have to see this kind of manifestation of poverty. This is the issue. Unquestionably, absolutely, 100% question. Solve the problem. Just arrest the people. It's not working. It doesn't solve the problem. visible manifestation of untreated mental illness. So my dad's bleeding to death with him. What do you want? You know me. Almost two years? You've been living out of your car? Yeah. With your four kids? Yeah. Before I didn't really talk about it. People are sorry for us. Do you have any chronic health issues? HIV. HIV? Wow, so I'm going to uh, stop right there, and I'm going to go right to uh, Leslie. Hi, Danny. How are you? Um, somber. <laughs> That's, uh, that, just that story of that trailer um, um, makes me sad about our condition. Uh, first of all, this is Leslie Silver, Dr. Leslie Silver, so I've known since 1986 mm -hmm. at, uh, in Cal, and um, Leslie is been a clinical psychologist now for how long? Let's see, uh, since 1991. Wow, 1991. And this documentary, Sheltered Mercy, tell my viewers what it's about and how you came to be involved in starting this and producing it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Zenny, and uh, for giving me this platform to talk about this documentary that I'm very, very excited that we're you know, finally launching some of our content on social media in the hopes of um, mobilizing a group of other people who are interested about this issue uh, that needs to be needs to be addressed. So I've been working in the mental health field uh, since the since the early 90s. I started off as a social worker and then I uh, became a clinical psychologist and it I saw um, very early on in my time when I was working with a lot of people that were underserved, didn't have very much money, that the system wasn't working very well um, to help these people. And that were there were a lot of people that were, were suffering, a lot of people not only on the street, but the people that are in the lower end of the socioeconomic bracket uh, in this country many of them don't get the services they need. And it, so I, I saw a system that was trying to help these people, but really not doing a very good job. And it was it's really also a story for all the people in the mental health field that are trying to help people with a system that really doesn't support them. So I, um, I, I saw that there was a story out there to be told when it first started this work. And I realized that, you know, uh, since that time, since the early 90s, the issue of homelessness is increased significantly every year. It increases. And that most people don't really understand the stories behind the people um, that are on the street. I mean, we literally walk by these people every day. We literally drive by them. And we we pass by these very um, desperate conditions of illness and deprivation and some really, really sad stories. And we don't know anything about these people. And when you work in this field and if you sit down and you talk to these people and you hear their story, you realize, well, it kind of makes sense they're out on the street. Um, so, you know, and, and so part of the goal of this film is to look at the social and political systems that are currently in place and try to expose the deficiencies in the, those systems, but using the stories of the homeless people as conduits to tell that story. And um, also to dispel some misconceptions and biases about homeless people that I think everybody has a different story and the reasons that bring people to homelessness 
are very, very different. And it's really unfair and ignorant to clump all homeless people into one category because that's just simply not the case. So the hope of this film is to um, wake people up, to show that there's a lot of people out there suffering unnecessarily. And that really is an issue that impacts all of us, whether we want to believe it or not. Uh, is an issue that's closer to us than we like to think. And we're all paying for it too, whether we want to believe it or not. So it's not um, just an issue of trying to mobilize empathy for homeless people, but it's really an issue of like, look at this system that is not working and it's creating problems for our communities. It's uh, a policing issue. It's an issue of filling our emergency rooms um, because they don't have any regular care, which isn't cost effective. It's an issue of filling our jails. It's an issue of um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a public health issue. You know, uh, communities don't provide bathrooms and trash cans, so we have trash. And we have homeless people that are urinating and defecating in the streets because they have nowhere to go to the bathroom. In Los Angeles County in the past year, uh, hepatitis and typhus broke out because of the issue of homeless people going to the bathroom and it filtered into the waters and the soils. And we're spending a lot of money. We're spending a lot of money. So empathy alone isn't going to push the needle to solve this problem. I think the common uh, denominator here is economic incentive. And that's just the truth. And I don't mean to sound... Um, not caring to the people that are suffering. I am one of those people who who will uh, spend a lot of time talking to these people and, and, and crying with them. But the bottom line is we're not spending our money well as a community, as a city, um, state government and federal government as well. And I think it really needs to be looked at very carefully because a lot of taxpayer money is being spent on an issue that is getting worse every year. And I think that there are some obvious things that can be done to help this problem. So this film is hope, you know, is going to, the hope of it is to, to really wake people up, um, to elevate the dialogue around this issue. And if we can do that, I I'm hopeful that maybe some effective policy changes is in our near future. And that would be a dream if that occurs. Hey, so folks who just uh, join in real quick, just a, a note, uh, make sure if you have questions for Dr. Silver, just type your questions in on the sidebar. I'll read them. Uh, and for th- those of you who um, may wonder, there is a 900 word filter. So if you write something and it's not appropriate, it will get automatically deleted. Um, that said, uh, I'm curious, where are you in the production of the movie? Uh, when do you, when will it be released? Uh, 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 and so on. Or is, there, is there funding? Can we get involved in helping you fund it? Um, where is everything? Thanks for asking that question, Zenny. We're about two and a half years into filming, and we're going to film for another year and a half to two years. And we're looking at a film release in the fall of 2020 to maybe January 2021 at the latest. And we wanted to film over a long period of time because we wanted to follow the stories of some homeless people and um, see them through the course of time to show what happens. Um, what happens when they try to um, find housing or employment? What happens to their relationships? What happens when they try to get medical care and mental health care that they need or care for drug and alcohol addiction? What happens? And so uh, I feel that it's a much richer way to tell the story if you can show the story over over a period of time. So this is, film isn't just going to be, you know, snapshots of desperate situations. It's really going to be getting to know some characters um, and getting to see their story up close and and see it in a very intimate and vulnerable way. Hey, take us through some of the stories of the people you've met so far. Uh, because my mom, in looking at the trailer, remarked about the gentleman who said he had HIV. and mm-hmm. But then it looked like he was playing piano very yeah. well. Uh, yeah. What is that exemplary, the kind of folks that you're meeting who are just extraordinary, but in some kind of way have not received as a family help? What's happening? 
You know, there's such a variety of, of issues um, really that leads to homelessness. In that particular case, um, that individual I think, suffered a, a mental illness break in his early uh, 20s. And the family didn't have the resources to get him adequate care. But frankly, there wasn't, there isn't, um, there's not that much care available for people that don't have money or insurance. Uh, we don't really have inpatient psychiatric care for all intents and purposes in the state of California. I think the recent statistic is almost one psychiatric bed per 6,000 people in the state of California. So um, outpatient care for people that can't pay private uh, premiums is really, it's, it's, it is not, it's not very available. It's there. There are community clinics, but it takes a while to get into. And, um, you know, so he just kind of slipped through the cracks. And then once you're on the street, often you fall to using drugs and alcohol and you then develop a drug and alcohol dependence on top of that. And there's a lot of unsafe behaviors that occur on the street. There's a lot of physical assault and sexual assault. And so you kind of kind of get stuck sometimes in circumstances and then you miss out on opportunity. You miss out on jobs. You miss out on education. And then suddenly you're in your, uh, the middle of your life, and it's not so easy to find a way to pull yourself back out of your circumstances. Um, and this particular individual just happens to be a very skilled piano player. He was self-taught, um, didn't have money. I, he tells the story of his mother saving coupons to buy his first piano and bought it, and he learned on that. And he... Um, you know, learn by ear. So he has that talent, but all the other... He's a genius. ...has not allowed him to really um, do, do much with that in terms of being able to make it, make it income or, or hold a job down because of that. Is it that... Where do we go from... I, I don't know if you remember, when I was growing up, uh, there was... We, we had the term, a person might be a bum, right? Mm -hmm. But... Uh, it was once in an occasional while you'd see someone on the street. But where do we go from that to now where, uh, and this is my pet peeve with this situation, it seems like homelessness has become a class mm. as opposed to something that you are temporarily in and you rise out of if you ever get there at all. I mean, yeah. it, it, where do we get to this point where it just seems like the system has failed or has it? Well... That that's um that's a big question, but l let me see if I can try to answer it. I mean, there's a a lot of different reasons, but you're right that homelessness has just been clumped into this one big class of people, which really doesn't describe it very well. Um, but why it's hard to get out of homelessness once you're in it? I mean, one big reason is that California just doesn't have very much affordable housing. I um. <laughs> Yeah, believe it or not, I'm still and sending. That, I'm still sending combined rent. <laughs> with, combined with not adequate uh, mental health care and medical care for people that don't have very much money, when the psychiatric inpatient hospitals were shut down in starting in 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 the late '60s and the '70s, at that time, believe it or not, our state had a surplus of low income housing. The idea when they closed those hospitals was, okay, we don't want to just lock people up. Um, and there was some good reasoning behind that. We don't want to just take people in our community that have mental illness and just lock them up with no possibility of having a normal life. We don't want to do that. Um, and so that was a reasonable, that was reasonable thinking. But what was supposed to happen and didn't happen was when those hospitals were closed, it was, um, there was, the communities were supposed to fill that need by building a lot of outpatient clinics and outpatient mental health care or uh, child care or more transitional housing for people that weren't ready to live independently and all the sorts of support services um, that people with a mental illness may need or people with drug and alcohol dependence may need. And that didn't really happen. 
or it happened a little bit, but it didn't really happen to the degree that it needed to happen. And then simultaneously, um, the, the state of California became increasingly more a more expensive place to live. And um, so the property values went up and low income housing was not built um, to meet the demand of people who needed it. So right now in Sacramento County, where this film is focused, is there's the availability of low income housing is about 2% right now. Um, there are 70,000 people on the waiting list to get a housing choice voucher, which means that they're eligible to get their rent subsidized. So they don't have to pay 30% of their gross monthly income for rent. Well, the list is closed. You can't even get on that list. Mm. There's 70,000 people on the list and it's currently closed. Um, Sacramento County talks about building more affordable housing and there are some plans in the make, but the bottom line is it's just not happening quick enough. In addition to that, uh, we don't provide enough shelter space. I mean, shelter is a temporary solution, but we also know that if you can get people off the street and you can get them a roof over their head and they can be warm and they can have a place to sleep and you can bring services to them that they can get stabilized much more quickly than if they're out on the street every night. So we also don't have n enough shelter space. And that is true in every city in, in the whole state of California. Um, so those are the two primary reasons, not adequate um, mental health and health care and for people that don't have money and even people that do have money and insurance is we don't have adequate mental health care a uh, mental mental health care in this in this country not only this state and we don't have an affordable housing so um you know what are we going to do we have to build more affordable housing and so those are the two primary reasons but you know there's a big difference between you know, uh, there's a wide spectrum of, re of why people are homeless for instance in california Anywhere between 11 and 14 percent of full-time college students at the universities and the state schools report that they're homeless. Okay, mm. now they might be couch surfing or mm -hmm. sleeping in their cars mm -hmm. um, or sleeping in the student lounges, but that's because the math doesn't add up. They can't even. These are students who have financial aid, some of them, but they can't afford tuition and their books and rent. And so many of them decide, you know what, I'm. I'm going to buy my book and I'm not going to pay for rent and I'm just going to hang out on my friend's couch for a while. And when they get tired of me, well, I'll sleep in my car for a while. And so that's just sheer economics, right? That's our net, our future generation that we're educating this state, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue. Um, women who are victims of domestic violence uh, and women's and family, that's the primary cause of homelessness for women and, and children is that they're escaping domestic violence. And and so some of those women, you know, have to escape and they don't have um, money and they don't have necessarily skills to get a job easily. So so that can be a reason. Um, the statistics vary, but I think in Sacramento County, they estimate that about 45 percent of the homeless people are on the street because of untreated mental illness. So that was the cause of it. So something happened and they weren't able to get the care that they needed because we don't have sufficient care in this state and in this country. And so um, they ended up homeless because of that. Um, and that can be a reason. Sometimes um, you, it's just some bad luck. You know, you, you lose a job, you go through a bad divorce, you don't have um, the safety net of, uh, financial resources, you don't have family to help you out, and you're just one paycheck away from not being able to pay your rent. And so that's a reason for some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the reasons are very, very different. Sometimes it's drug and alcohol dependence is the reason that leads people onto the street. Um, and so there's not adequate inpatient care uh, for out drug and alcohol treatment. That's another big issue. So that can be an issue. I know with uh, teens, there's the largest percent of teen and young adults that are homeless identify on the LGBTQ plus spectrum. And many of them have left their homes um, where they're living because they don't feel safe or accepted. Hmm. And so they leave. Hmm. Um, so they're there because of feeling discriminated against and oppressed. And then they find themselves on the street. And then often they fall into circumstances that end up 
um, you know, keeping them on the street for for a while. So so that's that's going to be another issue. We have a lot of young adults and teens that graduate out of our foster care system that have a history of instability, many abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse as a child, and they graduate out of foster care at 18. And I think the statistic is between 18 and 20 um, foster care youth have a high um, chance of either becoming homeless or incarcerated in those years. Mm. So, and then sometimes, you know, some of the issues, it's, you know, the, the problems can go back generations deep. You know, some of the people we met on the street are, are victims of systemic poverty and racism that go generations deep. Mm-hmm. And so I think as a, as a society and as community, we need to look at these people more in a more open-minded way. And I think we need to look at them more compassionately. Um, and that understand that you can't really fairly evaluate someone in the circumstances you might see in front of them. Because sometimes, as I said, you know, they're generations deep into having nothing or um, being victims of abuse or racism or poverty. And how you evaluate that? How do you evaluate the impact of that, the circumstances of that? So it's complicated. I just want to take a quick uh, mention of uh, members here who are making statements. Steve Simmons, thank you very much. He says uh, that... uh, doing a, a great job of explaining the problem. He lives in Oakland. There's so many homeless in home in Oakland people. He says they're losing apartments and houses every day. Um, and then uh, Jamal Mills, who's a regular viewer, says that his wife is in the same uh, business as you, by the way. So they're listening oh. in, in quite intently. Um, I just wanted to ask, too, what because I know you talked to uh, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom, among others, and what is your sense of how politicians are responding to the problem. I ask that for this question, uh, for this reason, rather. Uh, Up until 2011, we had something called California Redevelopment Law. And to make a long story short, we had in Oakland a 20% housing, affordable housing set aside budget that for 2011 alone was 111 million. That was just for 2011. It was a 108 million the year before, the year before that. Today, we would give our right eye tooth to have that kind of money. And Mm -hmm. my impression is that the elected officials, when I mentioned to them alternatives, they say, yeah, we're going to use it. They never do. Uh, And then we have one state senator who I like, Scott Wiener, as a a person, but I do not like his new policy, uh, SB50, which basically focuses on building dense housing around transit, but that housing that he wants to be built, if you take a look at the regulation, it says nothing for actually financing development so that it assures the construction of affordable housing. And you raise the issue, when I raise the issue, he never answers the question. So uh, it seems to me that there's a, uh, I'll give you another example. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Sullivan in West Oakland who uh, raised $72 million to start a real estate company. And some have alleged that he has been responsible for as many as 356 evictions, he says only 40, through a spokesperson, uh, in West Oakland, uh, taking over houses. And one of the people, persons who's financed part of that $72 million is none other than Tom Steyer. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you start to look deep at this, and particularly in the California uh, example, we call ourselves progressives, what is it that we're doing as progressives politically that all of this is happening on our watch is this all just name and we really don't care and some of us are just getting paid off by super rich people what's going on yeah yeah it's a great question and and super complicated I, i'll try my best to answer i mean first i just want to respond to gavin newsom you you mentioned him mm-hmm. i mean i think it's exciting i think um i'm very excited that he's elected as our governor Ditto. i think he has mm-hmm. plans for us the state. I think he is saying all the right things. Uh, I think he's building a big team of people. He's not all about like, I've got to do this all by myself. And he's building a big, a pretty big team of, of his, not just his cabinet, but people under his cabinet to address things. So let's see what happens. But I think his mind and his heart is in the right place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do believe that. I, I, I think he is genuine. And I think Gavin Newsom is someone who's not afraid to um, say something that's not popular. I mean, he was one of the first politicians to bring the homeless issue to 
the political um, platform when he was county um, the, the supervisor of San Francisco, mm-hmm. where he had his Care Not Cash program. Right. And, you know, he got a lot of people off the street. The problem was that the rate of homelessness was faster than we could get people off the street. So he, I think, sometimes gets criticized about well, that problem mm-hmm. program didn't work. A lot of things actually did work about that program. It's just that the rate of homelessness was faster than than some of the things that that program could could do to get them off the street. So that's responding to Gavin. Um, you know, I think that I think it's interesting. I think that well, first of all, we're facing a lot of cuts from the the federal government um, with our current um, administration. They're just um, making massive cuts to HUD, um, Housing Urban Development. So that's trickling down to states and communities where they don't have as much money to work with mm-hmm. um, to, to create affordable housing for, is one issue. Secondly, there's a lot of um, um, this expression, have you heard it, NIMBY? Oh, not yeah. Not my you know, so people are like, oh, yeah, you can build affordable housing, you can create a shelter, but just I don't want to look at it. Right. So, you know. And then there are the YIMBYs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, YIMBYs. So I think that, you know, <laughs> these people are there. They're in our communities already. So I think we have to just stop kidding ourselves. And we just have to do a variety of different things. I mean, I say, hey, just let's throw everything at the wall. And let's do everything. We got to build more shelter. I think there's all sorts of different types of housing we could build. I don't know if you've seen um, these housing pods where they're like these little uh, mobile small units mm-hmm. uh, that are quite affordable that can stack, um, you know, and that would be a great option for people that are facing that or uh, living on the street. I think that they'd be quite affordable and you could stack them. We can start building. We have to build more high rise, smaller unit apartment structures. Mm-hmm. Um, and, we need to do that. And I think that we also have to create some kind of incentive for landlords to yeah. rent to people that might have um, a eviction record, mm-hmm. um, might have a criminal record, <laughs> might not have a good credit record, because that's the, the, is the condition of almost everybody that's and, homeless. And that's why I came out if I may, yeah. with my question, because when we had redevelopment and is when I worked for Elihu, we had that kind of money. And then Jerry, t- when he became governor, took it away. Uh, and that's a, that's a story worthy of a two-hour movie. And over the period of time after he took it away, from 2012 till now, we have had a complete creation of a gigantic problem that would not have existed had the program been in place. And even Jerry admitted he made a mistake. But now mm-hmm. we've got, uh, and I'm not, it, it, look, all the elected officials that we're talking about are all friends of mine. So, it, you know, I, I'm pained by what's happening. I don't say this to criticize anybody. It's painful. But my sense is that we, we're, we're kind of like not talking and working together. And if I mention some, Libby Schaff is my god sister, okay? And mm-hmm. she's stuck in a hard, walk in a hard place. She's uh, trying to appease people who build in Oakland, understandable. But then she's got a gigantic homeless problem on the other hand. And the tools, but I don't know what's going on politically where we don't do what we used to do as a city. And it's to the point where at times I just basically cried because I'm not used to seeing Oakland like that, you know? Yeah. And I know you see people feel the same way about Sacramento. So I'm asking the question, I mean to, to go off in that direction, I'm bringing myself back home. From your point of view, do people care anymore? Because I get the sense that people just don't care. That's what bothers me. Yeah, I don't. I'd like to say that I disagree with you. Sure. Um, I can see how you would think that. And in my cynical moments, I, I think that too. But I think more than people not caring, I think people don't know what to do, honestly. I think it's a really complicated problem, and people see this problem that is hard to look at, um, sometimes scary, and they don't know what to do. So I, I think that's a problem. And I don't think those that that's the fault of individuals and you know in the citizens i think that's a job of policymakers because it's a job of the policymaker to create the plan that's going to work and educate the public and get them to believe in the plan and get them behind that and then follow through on it um we just need way more housing and what are we going to do in this state where there's too many people that don't bring in 
um, enough money to afford the cost of rent mm-hmm. and how. So mm-hmm. that's a problem. So we have to fa- address that. And in fairness to some of the landlords, I mean, if you're a landlord and you own a building, you own a building, um, and you can rent out, and you can rent out to a family that doesn't have, you know, that has um, doesn't have an issue with um, any credit problem and doesn't have any arrest issues and um, can has the money to uh, bring in the, the rent and you look at them and you think, I don't think they're going to be a problem by paying rent every month. You can't really blame necessarily the landlord of saying, well, I'm going to take that person, you know, mm-hmm. because that's a, that's a reasonable investment and mm-hmm. they got to, you know, they got to pay their mortgage too. So, um, but it's a problem. So some communities have tried to do creative things by do things like create an economic incentive for landlords to rent to people that can only afford uh, lower income housing. But um, we need to do more. I mean, we need to do a lot more, much more quickly because how much more housing we need is we're not even close to keeping up with the rate to which it needs to happen. Um, And I think we need to overcome some of our own biases and um, prejudice within us about what that means to have a low income housing building in our neighborhood that we have to look at. I think everyone needs to maybe really evaluate honestly their own um, thoughts, their own potential prejudices, their own judgments and maybe unwillingness to make themselves a little uncomfortable Um, Because by not doing that, you know, we have too many people that are suffering right in front of us and it creates its own set of problems. So we're not getting away from it. You know, it's going to affect us one way or another, whether we like it or not. And we're going to pay for it one way or another, whether we like it or not. So let's do it in the way that is most effective. You know, that's what I'm saying. Hey, question. Which comes Mm -hmm. first, homelessness or mental illness? Well, uh, it, it depends on the person, but mm-hmm. I would say that in in currently, you know, there's a lot of people with, I mean, mental illness, okay? First of all, mental illness, that's a very broad category, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, anxiety and depression is technically a mental illness, right? And and those are treatable conditions. and. You know, that goes all the way up to socioeconomic spectrum, not just people that are homeless. So I think if you have money and you can get treatment, you can manage those conditions and you're less likely to kind of fall through the cracks. Um, so mental illness should not cause homelessness. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be a cause of homelessness. And it is, unfortunately. As I said before, I think it's roughly anywhere between 40 and 55 percent are the statistics in the state of California of people that are homeless due to mental illness that isn't being adequately treated. The thing about um, some of the most um, some of the types of mental illness that seem the most debilitating when you don't know anything about like paranoid schizophrenia or uncontrolled bipolar conditions with psychotic episodes you know, if you don't know anything about mental illness, those people are, are the people you see is like, oh my gosh, that person's crazy. They're talking to themselves. They look really disheveled. Um, you know, they are yelling and screaming. Those conditions are actually quite treatable um, if you can get them on medication and if you can put them in a stable living environment. And often, uh, schizophrenics in particular are quite intelligent. Um, and so, you know, those people could be living a pretty high functioning life if we had treatment for them. Hmm. Once you're on the street and you're dealing with all the hardship of being homeless and you have a mental illness such as schizophrenia uh, or any kind of mental illness that has psychotic features to it. And the more time that goes on where that doesn't get treated, the more time it takes to get that person stabilized. So, you know, that person is going to need an inpatient psychiatric stay for, you know, maybe several weeks, maybe a couple months, and that we simply don't have the capacity to provide that in this in the state right now. So those people never get treatment. Um, the only thing that we have is a system that, in my opinion, does not work very well and is costly, um, is the... Uh, the 5150 um, mm-hmm. uh, provision, where if someone is at risk to themselves or risk to someone else, 
then they can be hospitalized for up to 72 hours. So they have to be suicidal or homicidal when there is someone that is being directly threatened. So having thoughts of killing someone, but they have a specific person they want to do it to, then you can involuntarily hospitalize someone and they're only in there for 72 hours. Can you explain? And then they usually explain, come back out, it costs a bunch of money, and their condition usually doesn't get treated. Can you explain my viewers how that works? Because, uh, because uh, a lot of people uh, who may not be in pardon? California are... Can you explain my viewers what the 50, 5150 program is? Because a lot of people who are outside California may not know about it. It did actually come into play with the whole Barbecue Becky situation. But uh, okay. but yeah, explain okay. my viewers what the 5150... Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah, so... 5150 is a, um, it's a, um, I think it's a, it's a legal code where you can involuntary, involuntarily hospitalize someone and it has to be done by a police officer. And there's very, very strict and limited reasons why, um, that you, someone would have to fall into. They have to be having thoughts of killing themselves and have a plan of how they would do it and tell you that they have intent to follow through on that plan. So for instance, if someone is saying, yeah, I want to die, I have this bottle of pills, but I'm not going to take it. And yeah, I, I'll promise not to take it. Then you cannot involuntarily hospitalize someone. Um, additionally, someone who is homicidal, but homicidal meaning that they have a specific person that they are going to tell you that they want to go and, and, and kill. So someone, you know, you meet someone, I mean, if someone came into my office in my private practice and said, was having homicidal thoughts, was enraged, wanted to kill someone, but didn't have a specific person in mind, they could walk, walk out of my office. In fact, legally, I would be legally bound by the rights of, confident, of their confidentiality, and I couldn't even call anybody and tell anyone about it. So it's very limited, um, but only in those conditions where... Um, someone is suicidal and they're telling you they're going to, they have a plan and they're going to fall through on it or someone's homicidal and they have a specific person that they're telling you that they are going to hurt, um, then you can involuntarily hospitalize them. Our hospitals are so full that, I mean, that they only stay there sometimes for 24 hours. The law only says 72 hours. If after that 72 hours, they remain um, within that criteria, the 5150 um, criteria, then they can you can continue to stay for for if if you choose. Most of the time, people are out of the hospital within 24 hours, sometimes less. So it's very costly for mm -hmm. police services to do that. It's very costly for ER services. So one thing is like, you know, think about all the money we spend on emergency room care um, and policing this problem. That if we could direct that into services, that would be much more effective. That is that is a very obvious solution to this problem that I believe needs to happen. I'm curious. You said too that you didn't, you weren't, uh, for want of a better term, a fan of the program. Why is that? Well, I think it works under very limited circumstances, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and where someone really is, I mean, we don't want people to um, hurt themselves or hurt others, yeah, right, right? And if we can get them hospitalized and get them through that period where they're not thinking clearly, um, that's a good thing. But what would be a much better thing is to have more preventative care that meaning that we would have care where people don't get to that point. All we're doing is we're waiting for these crises to erupt. And then we respond by having police intervene and emergency room services, the two most expensive things that we could do to treat it. What would mm -hmm. be much more effective is if we had um, a lot, a lot more available, affordable mental health outpatient care more inpatient psychiatric care so these people could get treatment before they got to the crisis the crisis point i mean um talk to any parent talk to a teacher talk to anybody who's running a company a business um you always want to deal with an issue before it becomes a crisis or a big problem right you nip it in the bud we don't really do that uh, with how we're addressing uh mental health in, in this country, and it's it's a problem. And coming back to the conditions in Sacramento, I know around Lake Merritt in Oakland, we have uh, it, we have at least seven homeless encampments around Lake Merritt alone, maybe more. Yeah. Two of which were I think dismantled very recently, uh, and a population that's estimated to be as large as seven thousand people. Um, and it's becoming to the point where I think. I, I calculated one estimate. Basically, one out of every ten working persons in Oakland was was homeless at, at some point statistically. Um, what's it like in Sacramento? What, what? 
Yeah. Um, similar. I think Sacramento is a smaller city, so there's not quite as many people, but it's it's a similar issue. The, I'm glad you brought this up the issue of uh, camping because that's a um, it, it's kind of a it's a, a topic around this homeless issue that a lot of people debate. Mm -hmm. There have been some cities that have allowed uh, people, homeless communities to have to camp thinking that if you can allow them a place to safely camp, provide them uh, trash bins, provide them porta potties or, or public bathrooms that it's self-contained. And that in fact, homeless people have found that they can live within a community of camping and live pretty peacefully and cooperatively. And it's a whole heck of a lot better than having them dispersed all over an entire city uh, where they don't have the support and the structure of the community that people find in homeless camps. So some communities like Seattle has done that and, and did it actually, you know, pretty effectively for a while. Um, I don't know if Oakland has, um, there's been much talk about the anti-camping legislation, but for years, you know, homeless people would get arrested for, for camping. And uh, many different uh, cities and civil rights attorneys have, have sued cities. I mean, this has happened in Sacramento for saying you cannot arrest an individual for camping when you don't, when that city does not provide shelter or affordable housing for that that person, so you cannot penalize that person. There, for that. There's an active and suit on that. Okay. And it's and it typically lost for years. Just last, um, in September of 2018, in Iowa of all places, the Ninth um, Circuit Court, it um, won and it overturned the someone representing a, a home, some homeless individuals won, and um, that saying that it was. Um, illegal, well, unconstitutional, essentially, to arrest someone for camping. And then when that happened, it trickled down to San Francisco and then Sacramento. And I'm pretty sure Oakland is the, is the same. Mm -hmm. We're now we no longer arrest someone for camping, um, a homeless person for camping. There is talk that, you know, everyone's trying to appeal this. You know, people that don't like the camping are trying to appeal it. And this is an issue that actually might go to the Supreme Court. Um, it's, it's, it's possible. Whether it does or not, but unfortunately, what's happening now? The police are finding other ways to arrest homeless people. Mm. Um, they are, you know, can arrest them for um, indecency or nuisance. Public nuisance is the one. Public nuisance. They can find, um, they can find illicit drugs on them. They're finding ways, or they're finding ways that to deem that they're threatening in some way. Uh, I know in Sacramento, there's homeless people camping right now in front of City Hall, and they're camping there because there's a big awning um, that protects them from the rain. And then there's another building kind of just across the breezeway, so it protects this, this um, it's protective, it doesn't get a lot of wind because of that. So it's a very popular place for homeless people to camp. But it looks bad. The city officials don't like it when people from other places are coming into City Hall and there's homeless people camp. So they found a reason to rationalize um, clearing these people out. And in 30 days, there's an ordinance just got passed. In 30 days, the homeless people now have to get cleared out of um, camping in front of City Hall, even though technically you can't arrest them anymore. Wow. So, um, but yet they're just going to move them and they're going to go somewhere else. So there's nowhere for them to go. Hey, what, per what, just eyeballing it, what percentage of people you've talked to for uh, Sheltered Mercy, the documentary, are single women or f single women with families? Well, uh, in this move, in our film, I would say uh, about 30%. Wow. But I don't think that, re I don't know if that necessarily rec represents the general population. I'd have to look up that statistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, still the percentage of chronically homeless, and I think the definition of that is um, you have to have, you know, um, maybe it's, there's a specific definition of chronic homelessness, but I think it's about a, a year of being homeless um, or two or more than two to three long-term, you know, several week periods of being homeless over like a, a two year period of time. You read the, you meet the definition for being chronically homeless. Most chronically homeless people are single men. Hmm. I do know that to be true. What about in terms of race? Um, African-Americans overwhelmingly, are overrepresent the homeless population. Hmm. African African American men um, and women. And yeah, women. as a men and women. Yeah, 
And, you know, and, and, and people say, you know, it's another example of just the fallout of generational systemic racism and everything that goes with that. Right. Uh, yeah. So also, but th- th- I, a pop, right? I'm just get curious because, you know, where are the families? Because for example, like I'm here, my mom is 84. I send rent back to Oakland. You know, we have a family unit. I mean, albeit small, but every mm-hmm. time I think of a person, I always think, how come they're at home? with their family or with their, you know, what happened to their family? Did they move to California? What happened? Do you, do you get any sense of their individual stories that can form a, uh, will form the story that you're forming basically? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's just, everybody has their own story. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I, so I, I can't, there's not a general answer to that. Mm-hmm. I will say though, that I think um, our current culture has lost a sense of community and has lost a sense of connected family mm-hmm. uh, that it used to have that contributes to homelessness, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people slip through the cracks mm-hmm. when they don't have a large family unit to fall back on. When no, they don't no, have village. no village. No village. There's no village. No, you know, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. What, right. do, what do we do? What do, what do you, you know, this is our generation, I Leslie. What do we do? I was someone <laughs> this week about that. And this, I, we were, and the only thing we can come up with is a radical ideological shift, you know, that has to happen um, where we as a, as people, um, as citizens, as a community, we start thinking more about one another and helping one another than just about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We start thinking about what's the, what can we do uh, for the betterment of my community Mm -hmm. and the, around me versus what can I do just to only to improve my own circumstances and I think that you know this is cynical to say but I think that we have a very um our culture or has become very entitled Mm -hmm. and focused in on ourselves and very driven to make money and to accumulate material wealth and to kind of isolate ourselves off into big homes that um and private personal vacations that are more focused on that than out in the community with people. And so that there's this separation, but that's the thing that's somehow the, the culture, ha- our culture has developed. So that's the thing that people are aspiring to. And I think we need to rethink it and we need to get back to this thinking that, you know, it should be about all of us. Hey, and what, I, go ahead. I'm curious though, because you and I went to Cal and we, for all practical purposes, uh, benefited from the Clark Kerr model, where the, basically the state paid for the lion's share of the operation of the university. And uh, that came pretty much at the same time that we had California redevelopment law and cities were able to use their own property taxes to help builders make affordable housing and subsidize their buildings. And that has been taken away and there's no desire among the, another generation to bring it back, let alone know about it. And mm-hmm. I'm saying, what do we do without, at the risk of sounding like old fogies to say, hey, look, we did have the right idea and the folks before us had the right idea. Why don't we go back to that? Because it worked. Yeah. Was, you know? Because now, uh, we, we, you, yeah. now, you know what they call us? Socialist. I said, wait a minute, yeah. we had the program. Mm-hmm. Why is that yeah. socialist? You know, no one ever said change the market pricing, <laughs> you know, right. it's just like, I, I just, what do we do, Leslie? I mean, uh, you know, anyway, um, as Spike, you know, Spike Lee would say, some, help us. <laughs> I think we need to look for some um, hopeful new leaders that are, I think, are invigorating um, mm-hmm. some optimism and um, into our, 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 our politics and how our social systems will play out. I I think we need to look towards better leaders. And I think the person who's leading the country right now is um, the ideology that he puts out or lack thereof it is, is toxic. And I think it's cancerous. And I think it, it festers this sense that you can say whatever you want and not have to be accountable for it, do whatever you want, and, and think mostly, mostly just about yourself. And I think that's going to come crashing down. I don't think it's going to work. Um, 
So I, I want to remain hopeful that uh, where do we start with it? We just start within our community. We start by every individual one at a time reaching out to the person next to them and trying to help them. We start as a parent with my kids. I make sure that I teach my kids uh, the value of, of what they have mm-hmm. and that they sure know that a lot of people don't have everything that they have. But that's our duty as parents to make sure we educate our children and make sure that we just aren't just focusing on what can be the very best for my kid, but how can my kid help the community at large? So I think we need to just shift our ideology a little bit and remain hopeful because I don't think it's going to work in the long run if we don't. How are we doing on time for you, by the way? This is going really well. I got a lot of comments. (laughs) Oh, awesome. Awesome. Uh, what time is it? It is. is uh, I, I, I got a few more minutes. Got okay, another question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read some comments. So Steve Simmons says a one bedroom condominium, condominium, excuse me, in Oakland with a view of a dumpster is over $400,000. And then you have to add the, uh, HOAs, the home association for over 300 a month. Uh, and then Patrick and Blackman adds that's beyond expensive. Uh, G Taylor says, Hey, G Taylor, nice to have you here. He says an issue we had it was getting people who need help to get help, uh, not capable of making healthy decisions on their own. What about that? Have you found that that's the case with people you've met for Sheltered Mercy? Yeah, I mean, I, that's actually a really good point. I think that we have to, um, I don't think everybody can do the things that you and I could do <laughs> if we were faced with a, with a similar problem. We would figure out what we needed to do and we would step by step go about it and try our best to solve the problem. A mm-hmm. lot of the people that we meet don't have those skills, don't have those capabilities. And often that's because of a variety of different reasons, not having the same love. It's not just education, but that's a big piece of it. But many of them are victims of abuse and trauma and fractured families and not having good role modeling in their parents. Never being taught things that are basic things that we just take for granted. They don't know how to do a lot of things. And so it's sad and tragic, but we have to acknowledge that as a society because those are people that are living in our, in our towns, in our cities, and they're there and we need to help them help themselves. And I think we need to modify our expectations for everybody. Not everybody necessarily is going to be able to work a full-time job and hold, you know, carry their weight and, 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 um, um, do what you and I might expect each of us to do. You know, not everybody has that, that capability for a variety variety of different reasons. Some for some developmental disorders from years of trauma and abuse, um, of, so I, I think that if we can just shift our expectations, I think that we could create maybe some community living spaces as an alternative. I think that if we had more affordable housing options where the government subsidizes part of the rent, because no one, many people aren't going to afford that $400,000 condo, one bedroom apartment, they're never going to afford it. Mm -hmm. So we have to have government subsidizing some of it. So we get more people off the street. And I think we got to meet people at the level that they're at. And I think we've got to help, take people to the outer ledge edge of their ability to function. You know, not everybody outer limit is the same, but let's help people take them where they can go. And I think we do that. We can, um, you know, we can live in a place where we treat each other with more compassion, but people's overall functioning can increase significantly. And so instead of going around stomping out problems, and policing it um, and, you know, trying to figure out how to undo a big mess, we can start, you know, helping people be productive, Mm -hmm. um, members of society, in in the way that they're able to. Hey, so you said... Did I answer your question? I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, no, I think you did quite well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm curious. You said there's another year and a half, two years of filming? Or did I yeah. get that right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we're hoping for a, a fall 2020 release or latest January 2021. And so what what's the next steps between now and that point where in terms of uh, filming, is it, uh, what do you have, what, what do you have to do next? Well, we, we're, we, we got to continue to follow the characters that we've already 
have. Um, we're gathering more characters. Um, we're also, the characters are not just the homeless people, but we have characters that are part of the, the kind of the political and the social system. So we're, we're just focusing on Sacramento um, as we're using as a microcosm to tell a larger story that plays out across the state, across the country. Because we kind of feel like if we focus in on one community, we can tell the story in a way that's uh, tighter and a little bit more digestible, mm-hmm. rather, because it's such a confusing problem. Um, so we have in, in Sacramento, also it's, it's compelling, we feel, that it is the capital city of the state that holds the most wealth, and our state also has the highest poverty rate in the country. So this California is considered this desirable state, this glamorous state. Well, let's look up really closely (laughs) at the people who have fallen the furthest, right, Mm -hmm. in this capital city. Let's look up closely. Let's be honest about it, you know. Um, And I think that if you get up close and you look at those stories, you can tell a pretty compelling story because the issues that play out among the people that have fallen the furthest from the cracks are issues that also play out at all other points along the socioeconomic spectrum. It's just that they're more glaring there because they've lost the most. But we're also looking at the system. So we have the governor, we have the mayor, we have the president of Sac State University, we have the chief of police. We have a variety of different um, 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 medical doctors and nurses and social service providers that are running the clinics. Um, and city advocates that are fighting for the homeless issue. We have civil rights attorneys that are fighting for the rights of the homeless. So we're using them as characters to look up closely at the system. How is Sacramento in particular Hmm. trying to address this issue? Um, Because I think the problems that Sacramento sees and how they're trying to deal with this problem at a local level and then as a state level, because that's where state policy is made, is very similar, I'm sure, everything that's been playing out in Oakland or or San Francisco mm-hmm. um, or Los Angeles and really all around the country. So it's a bigger issue. This is an issue that is relevant um, around the entire country. One and last I would argue I'm it's sorry. the biggest domestic problem that we're facing. Yes, absolutely. And one, one question, because I could have you on here forever and I don't want to do that to you, but uh, have you branched out to the tech community because it seems to me that the tech community should lay be uh, blamed with some of this, a lot of this, some would say all of it uh, in terms of a problem. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, talking to somebody like a, a Mark Benny off of Salesforce, you know, or something? Yeah, like that. I mean, I, I would love to. I, I mean, part of the reason why we're doing this social media campaign right now is because we want to connect with people um, that are interested in this issue in different communities because, um, we're trying to mobilize a bigger team around this issue so we can get our story out. You know, we're swinging big with this film. We're hoping for wide viewership. And so, we, you know, we need to raise some money to, to finish the film. I won't lie. That's part of why we're doing this. We're going to we're gearing up for a Kickstarter campaign. We're applying for mm-hmm. grants. But certainly anybody, um, any company that um, has any philanthropic um interests and feels that this issue is important that wants to support our film we would be thrilled to bring them on and i will add you know how do they, how do they find um, you how do they how do, how do they do that how do they find you okay okay so go to um our website at shelteredmercyfilm.com mm-hmm. and and um you can email us at uh, there you find all our contact information there all our social media contacts there and there's email. You can email me directly on our website. And, and also, when, this is going to come out as a blog. It's not just a video blog post, but also a blog post on and on Google News. So that information will be in the description, which will be the blog post body as well when, yeah. when it's up. So, yeah. If anybody's interested, they can drop their email on into – we have an area on our website. And if you guys want to – if you want to um, be have your email as a list of someone who's interested in the film – you can go onto our website and you can drop your email right onto it. Wow, fantastic. So start a page, yeah. So we're accumulating emails. Fantastic conversation. Uh, Got to come back again. <laughs> Do it again. 
I will. Thank you so much yeah, for yeah. Um, having me and for welcoming onto, uh, me onto your show and for sharing, being willing to share our story with your viewers. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks, viewers, and uh, Patrick and Steven and, and GT and people I haven't seen in, in about a bit. And uh, I, I think I even saw, uh, even though he's not part of my normal group, I saw Meneth dragging a tag around Facebook. So, uh, hey, Meneth, if you're still around. <laughs> so, uh, a long time. Yeah. So but we got to come back. And uh, folks, uh, get involved because this is uh, uh, a crisis we need to solve. Uh, hey, yeah, and you everyone can follow us um, mm -hmm. on Sheltered Mercy Film Facebook, Instagram, or Sheltered Mercy Twitter because we're going to be releasing content, other videos, um, not just the one that you showed. We have lots of videos. We have different graphics and photos that we're going to be releasing. So if you're just interested in this topic, we I'd encourage you to, to follow us and, and share our posts so we can um, build um, a bigger network of people who care about this issue. And don't, don't go, Leslie. I'm just going to sign off here. Hey, everybody, thanks a lot. And uh, again, tomorrow night, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the NFL Combine and then the rest of the week. But thanks for uh, stopping by. And